Hi, this is Professor Paul Knopfler of UC Davis School of Medicine. I'm a stem cell and cancer researcher, but I also run a blog called The Niche and work on stem cell outreach. Today's video, which is part of a series I'm doing about stem cells, is focused on the idea of using stem cells as a therapy for diabetes. So I've recently done a post on this topic, so I'm gonna go ahead and share that with you. Uh, let's see, um, and we can kind of go through it together and, and talk about the main issues related to the idea of using stem cells for uh, diabetes. So here's my site, The Niche, and you can see the different resources here. You can kind of look around the top related to things like for patients or just information about stem cells. And as I said, I've done a recent post about the idea of stem cells for diabetes that I'm gonna go through today in this video. So you can see here a nice diagram from a paper I found um, that was like a review article related to um, the idea of different uh, cell therapies for diabetes. And it kind of gives us this nice timeline of different technologies, um, kind of like where we're at now, you can um, get insulin injections, you can wear devices like insulin pumps that are actually pretty advanced compared to where they were in years past. These devices um, can both sense blood glucose level, so they're kind of like a continuous blood glucose monitor. And at the same time, based on the levels of glucose they detect, they can uh, secrete insulin. So the idea in terms of where we're headed with cell therapies um, is that cells maybe will be better. You know, they're gonna also be a device in a sense, they're gonna be a living device and they're gonna be able to sense the blood glucose levels better than a mechanical device. And at the same time, these cells will also then be able to secrete insulin and, and in that way control blood sugar better than the devices can. That's sort of the principle behind using cells as a therapy for diabetes. So um, if you go to this post on my site, ipsl.com in, in this post about diabetes, you can take a look at this really nice diagram and also um, go to that paper. So I've already kind of gone through the idea of stem cell therapy, stem cell therapy for diabetes. Um, there's a huge amount of research in this area um, I did a PubMed search, PubMed is just like a medical um, database of research articles. I found 356 papers that in the title had uh, the word stem cells and diabetes. So again, lots of interest here. Um, I didn't find any meta-analyses of clinical trials. And that's simply because this is such a new area. Um, there's been a lot of interest in using cells for diabetes for a long time, but uh, it's still early days in the sense we, we only have a relatively few clinical trials ongoing. Uh, more are going to come, so that's exciting. So kind of shifting gears a little bit into these clinical trials. One of the companies that's doing a lot of work in this area, and, and you could say is perhaps the leader here, is a firm called Viacite. So they're using uh, embryonic stem cells as a way to develop pancreatic progenitor cells. So these are just cells they're, they're kind of like the cells you might find in a developing pancreas. And so Biocyte has made these devices, these little capsules that have pancreatic progenitor cells in them that are still in sort of in the process of differentiating. And they implant these capsules inside um, the bodies of either like mice, for instance, in preclinical studies or in actual patients, like in their ongoing uh, clinical trial. So these devices, once they're inside the body, there are different growth factors and things that kind of come in and, and the cells in the device get exposed to those and mature into a population that contains sort of these key cells called beta cells of the pancreas that, um, that can control blood sugar levels. So basically that capsule is like a little mini uh, pancreas and you might uh, in the future, like a diabetic patient. And, and here again, I'm mostly focusing on type one diabetes uh, they might have three of these capsules implanted under the skin in their back, and together those three mini pancreases maybe function like one um, mature human pancreas, sensing blood sugar, releasing insulin. Uh, so that's really the key idea there. Um, you know, it's exciting to think about the work by different biotech companies, by different uh, academic research labs in this area. Um, and uh, when I went to the database clinicaltrials.gov, which actually lists trials themselves, I found 230 clinical trial listings for a search of stem cells for diabetes. Not all of these are actual clinical trials. 
Um, there are just uh, a few of those, but uh, I, I still think the, that's an encouraging number. So Viasite's actually a privately held company. Uh, it's interesting to think about at some point, you know, what does the future of this company hold? A lot will depend on the data that they're able to generate. But over the years, I have often wondered if the company, you're sort of a fork in the road, you could think about it as, as that way, um, you know, it could get an IPO and become a publicly traded company. You know, there's a lot of potential advantages to that. Another thing I thought that could happen is they could be acquired by some other firm that's interested in this space as well. Another thing I mentioned in this post that's interesting is that Biocyte's been collaborating with a company called CRISPR Therapeutics to use gene editing to make cells that are more suitable for transplantation. And, and part of what's sort of the thinking there is that, um, and, and I'll get into this a little bit later, is that one of the challenges is, is that if you use cells from a different person to make this sort of living device um, you know, based on stem cells, the immune system of the patient may attack that and basically destroy the cells in the, the device. And so if you can use CRISPR to avoid that, that would be great. Uh, another firm in this space for a long time was a company called SEMA. They've been acquired by a larger firm called Vertex. And they're just now uh, at the point where they're launching their uh, first trial um, using iPS cells. So these are induced pluripotent stem cells uh, to create islet cells. Um, this refers to the islets of Langerhans. And so I think it's great. The more I think that's going on in this space with different companies, different technologies, um, even though the goal is sort of the same, I think having different approaches is the best way to go um, to have the best chance to help patients in different ways. Also in this post, I've listed um, some recent papers that I thought were really interesting. So uh, you can take a look at those. Now I wanted to shift gears again and kind of think through some of the challenges here. This is a really um, difficult thing to try to achieve, like a living uh, implantable pancreas replacement basically. Um, and, and so there are some, some challenges here. One is, and I think this was realized fairly early on, is you can't just sort of haphazardly inject uh, a suspension of cells themselves into a patient and expect uh, much to happen. Uh, I, I think that kind of approach is not gonna work well. So for instance, if you just inject replacement beta cells into a patient's pancreas, those cells could end up kind of scattered all around. Um, they're just sitting there waiting for the immune system to attack them. Keep in mind that it's thought that for type 1 diabetes, a major component of what's going on, the cause of this disease is that the immune system has attacked and killed a large number of the beta cells. So if you just stick the beta cells, new beta cells into the pancreas, they're probably not going to stay put that well. They might or might not, but also even if they stay put very well, the immune system may just come in and um, destroy them. So I think a lot of the efforts in this area now are focused on these devices like capsules that will have cells that may uh, uh, sort of have multiple benefits. One is that you keep the cells in one place, you keep them from escaping. So that could also be better safety wise. And also these capsules actually kind of a cool thing about them is if they kind of, let's say this is all working really well and you've actually treated a diabetic patient effectively, those capsules, because they're alive, they might kind of wear out over time, some cells might die. Uh, and so in theory, you could just kind of pop the capsule out and put in a brand new fresh capsule and kind of give a boost to the sort of pancreatic replacement function uh, of a number of these capsules. So one of the things about the capsules that is not so great, potentially depending on how the capsule is defined or designed, is that the capsule um, has to allow for sort of exchange between the cells inside the capsule and what's going on outside the capsule, right? It's because the cells in the capsule need to be able to sense the blood sugar levels in the body. They also have to be able to secrete insulin and that insulin has to get out and actually function in the body. So the capsules, um, these encapsulated devices, they need to actually have pores in them. They need to be able to communicate with uh, the rest of the body. And so that gets tricky because if you have too much of an open capsule, some of the pancreatic cells inside the capsule could escape. Um, you know, maybe that's not too likely, but um, more likely is that immune cells could get in there and potentially damage or destroy the cells <clears throat> in the capsule. So 
I, I think a lot has sort of gone into thinking about how to best bioengineer design these capsules and cells in them that together make up one device. The other thing about the capsules that I think has also been realized based on some clinical trial uh, data over the last few years is that you really need, um, the capsule doesn't just need to have sort of pores and things like that. It has to be designed in such a way that blood vessels can grow actually onto and into the capsule. <clears throat> so you have this sort of intimate connection between the beta cells in there and the vasculature. So again, you can have this really um, fine-tuned, very sensitive device that device, again, a living device that can sense blood sugar levels and secrete insulin that you know readily gets out into the bloodstream. So some some tricky things there in terms of how this works. Uh, you know, this also gets sort of the issue, you know, for these kinds of replacement pancreases in a sense, um, or partial pancreases, um, you know, do you have the patient's own cells in that device? And if you do, like you use iPS cells that were made, say, from the skin of a diabetic patient, and basically they're genetically the same as the patient's own cells, and then you differentiate those into pancreatic cells, then you maybe don't have to worry so much about the immune system coming in and destroying the cells inside the device. At the same time, again, kind of circling back, there are um, autoimmune or immune elements to type one diabetes. So even if the cells are the patient's own cells, it's possible the immune system could come in and, and wipe out some of those cells. So there's sort of a lot of moving parts here, a lot of different decisions to make like uh, autologous versus allogeneic, how open is your capsule? Uh, also exactly what is sort of the mixture of cells in this capsule? Is it basically pure beta cells? That's sort of one approach that some people are taking. Uh, or is it more like with biocyte where you have beta cells in the mix, but you have other pancreatic cells, you know, as to that sort of latter approach, is that possibly better in a way, because you have sort of the normal, more, more like the normal community of cells that are actually in the pancreas. And does that perhaps provide better sensing of blood sugar and secretion of insulin? I think we just don't know the answer to a lot of these questions yet, but it's going to be really fascinating to follow. So just, uh, kind of as I've been following this area of stem cell therapy for diabetes, what sort of surprised me is how much um, there is also a lot of attention being drawn to the idea of stem cells for type two diabetes. So again, this is a very different kind of disease. Here, your body isn't really using insulin very well. So if you were to somehow develop a stem cell infusion kind of technology or device, uh, it's not really clear to me that uh, a, a beta cell containing, containing medical implant would work that well for type two diabetes. Uh, we'll see, you know, I, I could be wrong about that to be a little bit skeptical there. We'll see how that goes. Um, it's just surprising how many uh, different studies are going on related to stem cells for type two diabetes, because I think it's really a different kind of situation. And in some cases, you know, I've seen all kinds of things uh, being studied like mesenchymal stromal slash stem cells or MSCs, bone marrow cells. You know, I don't really totally get to be honest um, how those cells, like if you just take some bone marrow from someone and re-inject it into the same person, into their bloodstream, how is that gonna help their type two diabetes? I'm not so sure. Unfortunately, we also, uh, if we kind of go further out to the extreme, there's a lot of stem cell clinics that claim that they can treat people's type one or type two diabetes with different kinds of like fat stem cells or bone marrow stem cells or uh, amniotic or placental stem cells. Again, you know, for all of those, I really don't get the rationale there. And I'm afraid with the clinics, they're really just trying to make money. So how do we sort of bring this all together? Where do things stand? What does the future look like? You know, I think um, the sort of stepwise approach that we've seen over the last decade or so for this idea of regenerative or stem cell based uh, approaches to diabetes, like a lot of things in, in medicine is really tough and it's taken longer than, than a lot of us might've hoped. You know, I think almost all of us have family or friends uh, with diabetes. So, you know, and some, some people of course, who are watching have diabetes themselves. And there's really an urgency, right? To get this kind of approach to provide another option for patients beyond those mechanical devices that again, while they've gotten a lot better, still have a lot of glitches sometimes or other issues. So I think, you know, looking ahead, we have to be realistic. 
um, and kind of based on how the last decade or so has gone, the coming five or 10 years, things are probably not going to explode in just a very short period of time. Uh, I do think we're way beyond what we were uh, at 10 years ago. Now we actually have clinical trials ongoing. We have data coming from those that sort of informing the sort of next phases of clinical trials. So I would say I'm cautiously optimistic. And if I had to make a prediction looking ahead, I think within 10 years or less, we're going to see an FDA approved cellular therapy uh, treatment for type one diabetes. I really believe that's true. I could be overly optimistic. I, I hope not, but I think just kind of where we're at now, I think we're gonna get something that's approved. It's probably not gonna be perfect. You know, it's really challenging to sense blood glucose and secrete just the right amount of insulin on the fly in real time. And the mechanical devices sometimes have challenges with that. And it's possible the cellular kind of devices in a sense, the sort of uh, engineered mini pancreases, if you will, you know, they're also not gonna be perfect, but the hope is they'll be better than the mechanical devices. Uh, another thing I'm kind of foreseeing that could be interesting that might happen is that there'll be sort of these combinations of uh, mechanical and cellular devices that together might provide sort of the best of both worlds, but we'll kind of see about that. So if you go to this post, you'll also see some references I have here that you can click on to get more information. That's kind of my overview of where things are at uh, with the stem cell or cell therapy for diabetes field. Again, I'm kind of optimistic about it. I don't think you can get a, a treatment today with really a realistic hope, like from a clinic of having a meaningful benefit for your diabetes. But I think uh, in 10 years, we'll probably see something that's FDA approved. So thanks for watching this video. Uh, I hope you'll check out our other videos. And if you find them valuable, uh, please subscribe to our channel. Again, this is Paul Knopfler here at UC Davis. Bye-bye.